Welcome everybody to lecture number 12 of Information Service Engineering, Basic Machine Learning Part 3. This is the last section of the machine learning part of the ISE lecture. So before we come to our new topics, of course, as always, we have to do a brief recapitulation. What did we do in the last lecture and what was important? In the last lecture, you learned about a few supervised and unsupervised machine learning algorithms, so-called traditional machine learning algorithms. We started out with an unsupervised one, which was k-means clustering. So k-means clustering is really, let's say, one of the basic unsupervised methods. There you don't have labeled data. You want to see, yeah, what's the structure of my data? Can I, you know, if I know already, I want to, let's say, distinguish three, four, five, so a specific number of clusters, how can I achieve this kind of clustering? And k-means clustering is a kind of approximation, which tries to minimize the so-called within cluster variation to create these kind of clusters. And it's working perfectly fine and it's quite simple. Then we did regression. Regression is different from clustering. So what we did there is we want to predict a value, a specific value, you know, of uh, if, if we are given specific features and we have learned them from training data and uh, the learning algorithm, there is only a linear regression, which means, of course, if it's linear, we can't uh, find any other, let's say, functional, highly, uh, let's say, polynomial functions and stuff like that. But we also see that uh, multilinear regression and also polynomial regression work rather similar. And we tried also both of them out in a specific notebook of that lecture. And the last thing was decision trees. So for decision trees, we learned that, of course, they are, of course, uh, nice to also to visualize and to give explanations of exactly what is going to happen there, because you can visualize the decision tree and see how this uh, specific decisions come into play. And there, of course, in a decision tree, the order in which your features are checked and then uh, tested is rather uh, important because you know this can have uh, the, the tree can have an exponential growth in the end and this might be of course unwanted because then you will never end to compute the optimal tree for your decision so this was the last part of the lecture now what is going to come in this lecture in this lecture we will talk about neural networks which are of course the most popular machine learning technology nowadays. We will start right out in the beginning. So with the, let's say the first artificial neuron. So the mechanical pitts neuron, we have already learned about that in the very first machine learning lecture. Now we are going deeper into that and look a bit more exactly about, you know, what is special about it? What is the bias about? How is this kind of step function or sigmoid function that you use there really working? And then we are going to connect these color pits neurons in a single layer perceptron. So you have one layer of color pits neurons. This already is the most simplest neural network. This is then a perceptron. And you will see that perceptrons are pretty much capable of solving so-called linearly separable problems. What does that mean? For that, we are also talking about the notion of a decision boundary. So you can visualize these kind of decisions of these neural networks and you will see that, yes, a simple XOR problem was responsible for the first AI winter because these perceptrons also esteemed rather high and capable of doing, let's say, um, basic OCR tasks for, let's say, uh, SIP numbers. Um, they are not capable to compute in the end uh, an XOR function. This was due to the fact that, of course, if you want to do non-linearly separable functions, if you want to compute them, you have to invest more layers with non-linear activation functions. So not this step function that you have here and take a non-linear activation function, because this is also something what your brain does. So next part of the lecture, then we are going to look into multi-layer neural networks up to deep neural networks. So we have then many, many levers that, uh, layers that are interconnected with each other. And you will see that, yeah, this increases complexity. And it took until 1986, until we got out of the very first AI winter. This was uh, the point in time when they had uh, a way to, you know, transport the error that has been computed or that is part of the learning algorithm of the perceptron when you compare the expected output 
with the actual output, you have to propagate this error through the network and through the hidden layers. And you have usually no idea what's the expected output of the hidden layer. But with the backpropagation algorithm, this works quite well. One of the drawbacks then of these multi-layer neural networks was then feature engineering. So because you had to try out, so what have, do I have to feed into the network to create or to be able to make a decision in the way that I want to have in the end? And, and this, of course, is crucial, especially for tasks like, uh, let's say, um, image recognition. Image recognition was also the field where then the first so-called convolutional neural networks uh, had their first success. This is where the part of feature engineering was transferred to the network and the network also learned to do that based on primitive operations, which are then the convolutional operations and pooling operations. You will learn about that then for in the section convolutional neural networks here. Yeah, and then after convolutional neural networks, the last part will be about generative networks because you can use these deep learning networks not only for classification tasks you can also use them for generation tasks and you will see several examples for example image colorization so coming up with colors for black and white images or super magnification of images or also text to image tasks or image completion tasks which are you know solved nowadays uh, with with rather excellent results so this is really really nice what's going on there and they are usually based on so-called uh, comparative learning and one of the things in comparative learning we will talk about is or are the generative adversarial neural networks now you might ask yeah are these networks really intelligent and i will give you a short story or narrative of uh, this famous story of a horse called clever hans where people always thought this is a rather clever horse because, you know, the horse seemed to be able to understand human language and also arithmetics. But hear the entire story because, you know, to determine the intelligence of somebody is really, really difficult. Because you will see then also the example, the famous example of the so-called Chinese room. And then the question, is this room intelligent or not? Or who is there? Where, where is the intelligence sitting? This is a highly interesting question we will answer here then or raise in this chapter uh, for neural networks and deep learning. Okay, then we continue with a rather interesting and also popular application. We will look at word embedding. So this is then distributional semantics that we already know then from NLP. And this is an application of neural networks where you create these kind of dense vectors which also incorporate semantics from language if trained on large language corpora. So this will be then word embeddings revisited. And if we can do this for words, which means natural language, we can also try to do distributional semantics on knowledge graphs to create knowledge graph embeddings to transfer then the semantics, which is transferred in a knowledge graph, put then this then in a vector space. So. Um, in a vector space, what we can do then is, of course, we can do rather quick computations of semantic similarity, which if you take, let's say, a network graph as an example for that, will take much longer and are much, much more complicated than simply comparing two vectors. And there are other interesting tasks you can do, like, for example, link prediction and knowledge graph completion, for which you can then use a model to predict, you know, what would be uh, the missing link in a, a, a triple where you where you for example you miss either the head the relation or the tail okay so these are the topics we are going to talk about in this last section of basic machine learning and now of course we are going to start and we hope you will enjoy the show <laughs>